This video is about an experiment I've wanted to do for years and the unexpected result I got when I did it. Have you ever had a simple question ruin your life? Of course you have, right? Like it's perfectly normal to spend months and months doing nothing else but obsessing over a question that no one else cares about. Like, does light actually slow down in water? I know you probably think the answer is obvious, light definitely slows down, like we learned that in high school, but I've never really believed it. Like, it just seems odd. In Einstein's theory of relativity, the speed of light is this super fundamental thing. Like, no matter where you are in the universe or what speed you're going at, you will always find light to be traveling at the speed c. Except in a glass of water. I mean, how can that actually be true? I stopped worrying about it for a while because I thought there was no way to find out the answer until recently when I realized that there is a way to accurately time how long it takes for light to travel using something called LIDAR. And insanely, that technology just happens to be in my phone. Yeah, seriously, this bit of the phone that I managed to smash recently, that thing measures the time it takes for light to bounce off an object and come back. My phone uses that incredible technology just to improve the focus in photos a little bit. Insane. So of course I tried to do this experiment. Okay, it's angry. Mm -hmm. No surface detected. Come on. <sighs> this is ridiculous. Uh, yeah, so that didn't work this time. But eventually I did get it to work and it gave me the answer. It was just understanding that answer that took months off my life. The issue is that common explanations for why light slows down in water are wrong. And even the uncommon explanations for why light slows down are also wrong. So maybe light doesn't actually slow down at all? Incredibly, that's exactly what one of my favorite textbooks says. We'll get to that, but first, let's deal with these. Let's start with some explanations for why light slows down that are so common you've probably heard them in school, but they're completely wrong. I think the most common one, and the one that I believed for a while, goes like this. You have this light, and when it travels between water molecules, it's still going at the regular speed c. But what happens is when it bumps into a molecule, it gets absorbed by that molecule for a little while, and then later on released, and then absorbed again and released. And this adds enough time lag to the whole process that the particle has slowed down. Light does sometimes get absorbed by molecules, but we can tell that this explanation is wrong because when light does get absorbed, what happens is it doesn't remember where it came from and it gets re-emitted in any random direction. And so if we let it get re-emitted in random directions, then that means that overall the light doesn't go in a straight line from A to B, but every bit of light spreads out into all kinds of directions. And so when you look at light in water, you should expect that instead of going in a straight line, it spreads out. That's not what we see, and so that can't be the right explanation. Another reason you can tell this is false is because molecules only want to absorb certain frequencies of light. That means only specific colors of light would get absorbed and then re-emitted, so everything else should still travel at the speed c. But that's not what supposedly happens. Every type of light gets slowed down by water. There's another common explanation that goes wrong for exactly the same kind of reasons. And this one says that what happens is the light travels at the speed c between molecules, but it knocks into the molecules and ricochets around, which means that its path ends up being a lot longer than it would have been. You can see that this has the same flaw. It would mean that light should completely spread out, but that's not what we see. One thing to note about both of those wrong explanations is they involve thinking of light as a little particle like this, which I can tell you is almost always the wrong way to think about light. Like yes, in some specific circumstances, light acts like a particle, but not this kind of particle. And so I think that this is really an unhelpful way to think about light. And instead in this video, we're going to talk about light as a wave, which I'll explain later. But anyway, going back to those explanations, if those two other explanations are wrong, then what are some other common explanations that seem like they're more correct? 
there was this other one that kept coming up and it was about secondary waves. In the videos I'd seen, they'd usually make three claims. The first two turned out to be correct and super important to the actual answer, and the third turned out to be wildly misleading. Here they are. When you shine light into water, what happens is that the original light just actually goes through the water completely unaffected, but the electrons inside of the water do get affected by the light, and because of the light, they emit their own waves. When you add up the original light plus all of the light coming from the electrons, you supposedly get light that's traveling slower. Yeah, when I started this, I didn't understand the first thing about that explanation. And to get it, I had to go right back and figure out like what light even is. For that, I turned to my two favorite textbooks, the Feynman Lectures in Physics and Matter and Interactions. And in the process, I learned so much that I wish I knew about light earlier. We usually use the letter C to represent the speed of light, but I'd argue it shouldn't be called that. It should be called the maximum speed of causality, or even better, how quickly one thing can affect another. For example, imagine this is the sun and this is the earth. The earth is being held in its orbit around the sun by its attraction to the sun. You might have heard though that if the sun was to suddenly disappear, then earth wouldn't immediately be flung out into space. Instead, it'll take about eight minutes and then it will be flung out into space. Why is that? It's because the message that the sun has disappeared can only travel at a particular speed, which is the speed C. That is the quickest that one thing can affect another. C is actually the maximum speed in the universe because if there was an object that could travel faster than C, then you could use it to send messages faster than C and that's not allowed. I used to think it was kind of a coincidence that the speed of light was equal to the maximum speed of causality. Like maybe it was just because light was a massless particle or something like that. But actually there's a really good reason for it and it makes a lot of sense when you look at this next example. Let's say I have these two electrons. And this electron feels a force because of this one. But say I picked up this one and I accelerated it. Would this electron immediately know about this electron's new position and update the force that it feels? No, right? Because it needs to wait until the message from that particle arrives to it. But what's actually delivering that message? This is the key part. Light is the messenger. Whenever a charged particle accelerates, it sends the message far and wide at the speed C using light. But when I realized what kind of messages light sends, that's when I felt like I really understood light for the first time. Light's whole purpose is to harass charged particles. Imagine that I push this electron up and down, then the light that it makes is gonna be shaped like this. Here's what that means for the other electron that gets into the path of that light. If the light gets up to here, then this is supposed to be an arrow representing how strongly the electron is gonna get punched upwards. And then as the light travels, it punches it up even more strongly upwards. And then as it passes here, it starts to punch it downwards and upwards again and then downwards. The net result is that as this light passes, this electron is pushed up and down. Basically, the light is a packet of electrical forces traveling through space. Incidentally, this answers a question that used to really bother me. If light is a wave, then what's waving? We're used to thinking about waves as something like water waves where there's a physical medium that's sloshing about, but that's not the type of wave that light is. Light is just a wavering of how strong the electromagnetic force is at any point in space. You can see that at this point in space right now, the electric force points upwards, but a little bit later, it will point even further up and then later it will point down, and that's what light is. It's this field strength changing over time. Here I've represented it with these poorly made arrows because I think that's evocative of like these forces and how they change over time, but usually the way you represent light is with this wave. And you can see that it represents the exact same thing. This um, wave is just capturing how strong the forces are at every point. 
um, but it's just joined up so it looks a little bit nicer and so you'll see these pictures of like light as a wave traveling through space but it's the same thing. The thing that's waving is the strength of the magnetic force not any medium. Back to our poor electron we know that as this light passes it it will oscillate up and down but we know exactly what happens to oscillating charged particles. They're accelerating, so they're making light. The light that this electron makes is actually exactly the same as the light that originally hit it, except it's in the opposite direction, and usually it's a bit weaker. But what's the effect of these two bits of light combined? Well, let's look at it from the perspective of another electron that's further down the line. Is it going to experience two separate pieces of light? Well, actually, no, because remember, light is just a bunch of electric forces. So when this piece of light tries to push this electron downwards, this piece of light is going to be trying to push it upwards, but a little bit more weakly. You can see that that happens everywhere. When this one pushes up, the other one pushes down, but a little bit weakly. And so it's like this one slightly negates the effect of this one. It's actually a really similar effect to how active noise cancelling works. So when the headphones detect a particular wave of sound, they make their own sound, which is in the opposite direction. The crazy thing is, when you add these two pieces of sound, you get much less sound. And that's what this electron is doing as well. When it gets hit with light, it hits back with its own light that partially negates the original. So that was my mini crash course in light. And now we can just use those ingredients to figure out whether that explanation about why light slows down in water actually makes any sense. Remember the first bit was that this light enters the water and is completely unaffected by the water and goes right through. So far we know that that bit is correct. And then it says that the electrons that are inside of this water then react by making their own light. Which makes sense, because remember, as this light goes through, it makes all of these electrons jiggle up and down, and jiggling electrons make light. And it is true that each of these electrons responds by making their own light. When you add the original light with the light from all of these electrons, you would expect something interesting to happen. I mean, we've already seen that when waves add up, they can do interesting things like cancel out. But the YouTube videos in particular would use these animations to try and explain how when you add this piece of light that's traveling at the speed c with these other pieces of light that are all also traveling at the speed c, you get some light that isn't traveling at the speed c. This is the original light and this is what the light from the electrons looks like. And you can see that they're moving at the same speed because they don't move relative to each other. In other words, they always keep in time with each other. Now let me just add them together and the result is this other light that does move relative to the original pieces of light. And so it must have a different speed to the other two. When I saw these animations, I couldn't understand how they were working, but I felt that I had to accept it because they'd shown me proof. But here's the insane thing. When I was making this video, I finally tried to just replicate their little demonstration just to see for myself and like to understand it. So I did it exactly the way that they said they've done it and they do not work. Here we got the original light and the electron light, which is in a similar form. And then we're just going to add them together and look, they don't move relative to each other. I was so mad when I realized that these things are just straight up lies. You can't add two pieces of light that are going at the speed C and expect to get light that's going slower. It just doesn't work mathematically. And they usually mention the difference between phase velocity and group velocity at this point to try and explain how this could work, but that just muddies the water. I had to go and try and understand what those two things mean. And now I know that that phenomena is only relevant if you already have waves that are going at different speeds. So what the hell? You won't believe this, but as I was trying to make this animation for you, I realized what was going wrong and it's actually kind of ridiculous and I can't even be mad about it. Basically, I think that they accidentally left off a set of brackets. 
here is this electron wave and it's supposed to be traveling at the same speed c which it is right now but if i accidentally forgot about this set of brackets now even though the wave looks like it's the same it's actually not it's traveling at a different speed and so now the two waves are not traveling at the same speed c and so of course when you add them they're not going to travel at the speed c either and you can see that's what happens it's slightly annoying, but I think this was just an honest mistake. After I realized that these videos don't work, I turned to textbooks that I trusted, and they seemed to point to another possibility. Maybe light doesn't slow down at all. The Feynman lectures on this topic start off with a kind of cryptic statement that seems to suggest light doesn't really slow down. It says, it is approximately true that light does appear to slow down, but all contributions of the field are traveling at the ultimate velocity c. So in other words, the original light is traveling at the speed c, and so are all the other pieces of light. But maybe when you add them all up, they just appear to be traveling slower. I don't know, the statement was a little bit cryptic, so I wasn't 100% sure what it meant. But on the other hand, my other favorite textbook was completely unequivocal. It put it very bluntly. It asks you to imagine this experiment. Your friend aims a laser at your location, precisely at time t1, and turns on the laser. You record the time t2 at which you detect the light. Knowing the distance between your locations, you can calculate the speed. In this case, it will still give 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, even though there's water in the way. Or to put it another way, if you measure the speed of light in water using the most sensible method, which is to take the distance of this container and then just dividing it by the time that it takes for light to get from one side to the other, you get that the speed of light in water is actually just equal to C. In other words, light doesn't actually slow down in water. This is a very testable prediction. And so I tried to test it. For this, I'm going to use the LiDAR in my phone and the fact that it pulses light and it measures how long it takes for that light to get back. All right, so I'm about to dunk my phone in. And right now, before it's in the water, it's saying that there's about 30 centimeters to the other side. That's, um, way outside of the range that I measured. I want to clear up one thing about this measurement because it's quite confusing. So the thing that my phone can measure is actually time, specifically the amount of time that it takes to go from one side of the container, get reflected and come back. But it tells you that what it's measuring is the distance. How is that possible? Well, it uses the fact that distance is equal to the speed times the time taken. So the time taken is the thing that it actually measured, but it cheats because it assumes that the speed of light is always c. And since c is a well-known constant, it can use that value and the time taken that it measured to give you a distance. And that hack should work most of the time, unless you happen to be doing this experiment underwater and the speed of light in water really is slower than C. So supposedly light is supposed to slow down to about three quarters of its original speed when it's in water, which is a huge slowdown, which will absolutely mess up this distance measurement because this distance is measured using C as the speed when it should be C times three quarters. If you know the actual distance here and you compare it to what your phone says, if it says that the new distance is longer, that's because it wasn't correctly accounting for the fact that light slows down in water. But if you did this experiment and you found that the distance is actually the real distance, then that means that the time taken hasn't actually changed, which means that the speed is exactly the same as well. So that means that if the phone measures the distance correctly, the speed of light in water is actually not reduced. It's still equal to C. And that was exactly what I was expecting to find. This reading doesn't even make sense outside of water. What? This was a recurring theme. The phone readings disagreed with the actual distances, even when there was no water. 
a fatal flaw in my plan. Perhaps, but I pushed on anyway. Okay, whatever. So if I double tap on the screen. High accuracy at 26 one centimeter. Oh no, it just actually says it. Okay, this is perfect. All right. So let's put this in. Come on, talk to me. This was also a recurring theme. Every time I tried to put the phone in water, it refused to believe that there was a surface worth detecting. Okay, I'm back. Um, I think this is going to work. Here I've got this container that is nine and a half centimetres tall. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sit my phone on top of it. But then this time um, I'm going to pour some uh, water in and see how the measurement changes as we go. And like... If the speed of light is the same whether we're in water or not in water, then distance shouldn't change because the time that it takes for light to go from the top to the bottom should be exactly the same. How clever. It says that the height of this is actually 11 centimetres, which is a bit different from what I measured, but it doesn't matter. It does matter. Oh, please work, please work. Why is it suddenly not detecting anything? No surface detected. No surface detected. <sighs> yeah, that didn't work and it didn't work the next four times either. Even though I hadn't yet done the experiment, I was pretty sure about what the results were going to be because of this very simple argument. Imagine we have this light coming from this light source. If there was no water in the way, we know that this would travel through at the speed c. But even if there is water there, we know that the original light will travel through unimpeded, so it's still traveling at the speed c. The only difference is that there's now a second source of light. Every time this original light gets to a particular layer, the electrons in that layer are going to get oscillated by that light, and they are going to produce their own light, which I'm going to represent like this because it's some complicated thing that comes from adding all of the light from all of the electrons in that layer, but it's some sort of light. Here. Now, in terms of timing, there's one very crucial fact, and that is there's no time lag between the time that this light enters this layer and this, these electrons start jiggling and produce their own light. And that's because electrons produce their own light as soon as they feel any acceleration. So the moment that this non-zero force hits this electron, it will start oscillating and it will produce light and so there's no time lag at all. That means that whenever this light gets to a new layer, immediately there'll be some light from those electrons. But remember, when we're talking about the speed of light in water, what we're interested in is not the original light or the light coming from the electrons, but the sum of those two lights. Again, we don't know what it is, but it's gonna be some complicated thing. The question though is, how fast does this overall light travel through the water? And in particular, we wanna know, does it keep up with the original light going at the speed c, or does it go slower? Here's my argument for why it has to keep going at the same speed as the original light. Remember, the moment that this light gets to this layer, it will immediately produce some light from the electrons, which will then sum immediately to some resulting light. And so the resulting light has also reached the same layer in the same time. These three bits of light have kept in time with each other, which means that this resulting light must have been traveling at the same speed as the original, so they're both traveling at the speed c. So there you go, light really doesn't slow down in water. But then why do you get the effects as if light slows down in water, like the wavelength of light decreasing and like the light bending when it hits water? Well, the Feynman lectures explain how you get those effects from first principles, and Grant from 3Blue1Brown has made a very beautiful video explaining that whole proof. So I highly recommend that you watch that. So I'm not gonna go over that proof here, but I do wanna give you the very basic gist of it. And it all comes down to the fact that you can't send messages faster than the speed of light. Imagine our light now goes through a thin slice of water. We know that what actually happens is that the original light just keeps going through that material at the speed C and doesn't care at all. But the electrons inside of that material are disturbed by the passage of light and they start oscillating. There's one important thing that I haven't yet told you about the light coming from these electrons. So far I've been representing it as if the light from this electron only goes in the forward direction, but that's not actually true. 
each of these electrons starts to radiate in many different directions. However, it most strongly radiates forwards and backwards, but it does radiate in the other directions as well. Now, why does this matter? Well, you might have thought that if you had an electron here, it would only be affected by the original light and light coming from the electron directly in front of it. But that's not true. Actually, it does receive some light from all of the other electrons. The reason why that's so critical is this. The electron that's right in front of it is the shortest distance away. But this electron, for example, is much further. And remember that nothing travels faster than the speed of light. So even though all of these are actually bouncing in unison with each other, it's not going to look like that from the perspective of this electron because it takes some time for every message to be delivered, right? And the further away, the longer that that message is going to take because messages can only travel at the speed c. Imagine that these two are bouncing in unison and this particular bounce makes this first little peak of light. So far, these bits of light are in unison with each other. But now let's consider the bit that's going to arrive at this electron. Here, I better turn this one. By the time this one has arrived, they're actually pretty out of sync with each other. This peak that used to be in time with that peak is now actually in time with this trough. And so these two partially cancel each other out. In fact, if you add up the light from all of the previous electrons on an electron that's in the next layer of the water, then what you get is all these bits of light that are actually quite out of sync with each other. Even though the electrons really were bouncing in unison, from this electron's point of view, they're not in unison. When this electron looks at one of the further away electrons, it's looking at what that electron was doing back in time. It's actually the exact same effect that explains why when you look at very distant objects in the night sky, you're actually seeing how they were in the past. It's the fact that the electron's light is out of date when it gets to the next layer that overall gives the impression that all of the light is lagging behind. I read and reread Feynman's chapter on the refractive index for ages, but I remember the day when it all finally clicked. I was so happy because it felt like I just understood something very fundamental. I remember how happy I was so clearly because genuinely the next day this happened. Hi, <laughs> I'm panicking right now. One of my friends suggested that I try out this thing called chat. GPT. He was saying that like, you know, it's really good at answering questions, especially like factual questions. And so I should give it a go. And I wanted to ask a physics question. So I just asked, um, does light slow down in water? It said yes, followed by a bunch of nonsense. And I said arrogantly, I don't think so. Has there been any experiments to prove this? And the answer it gave me <laughs> has got me really panicked. Yes, there have been many experiments that have shown that light slows down when it passes through water. In particular, it mentioned an experiment done by Huygens using a telescope, but that's ridiculous because there's not exactly a bunch of water between here and the moon. I pointed that out and it did concede, but it said that many, many, many other people had done this experiment. And it was so confident that I started to get worried. <laughs> I don't know what to believe, I guess. I mean, I did all this math and I thought that that was um, definitive. And then now some AI is telling me that uh, I'm completely wrong and that people have actually done this experiment that I uh, am about to do. And they got a different result from what I expected. You can't make this stuff up. So anyway, um, <sighs> So yeah, I, I decided that I had to just do this experiment myself and I wanted to do it in a way that would 100% convince me that it was the right result um, and I wouldn't be second guessing it afterwards. So I decided that I'm going to buy a proper laser meter from the hardware store. I'm in the car right now because it's pouring and I'm just waiting it out. So yeah, uh, you want to buy that and hopefully that will give me 
the right results. Let's see. I got the laser meter and now what I'm going to do is that same experiment again. I'm going to test how um, far this meter thinks uh, the distance is from the top of this drug to the bottom and I'm going to do it um, once without water and then once with water. Okay, it gives me 11.2 centimeters. If the old distance is like 11 centimeters, then the new distance should be approximately something around 14.5. Okay, so if the result is like approximately 11 centimeters, then that means that the speed of light in water is about the same, whereas if it's about 14.5, then um, it means that the speed is significantly slower. So let's see. Aiming it for about the same spot and <sighs> okay. I think that's a positive result. So I've been thinking about maybe whether this doesn't work the way that I think it does. So it turns out there are two types of lighter. Um, there is one that's called phase-based lighter, and if you use that sort of lighter, um, it should give you a smaller speed of light because it's just based on the phase, and we know that the phase is delayed. There is a possibility that this is a phase-based lighter. Um, I think that's unlikely, but it might be why I'm getting the wrong result, or like what seems like it should be the wrong result. But there is another type of lighter, and that's called time of flight lighter, and it does exactly what you'd expect. It pulses light very, very quickly, and then that light comes, um, hits an object and bounces back, and it measures the time difference between when the, the light was sent and when it arrives back. So I wanna make sure that what I use is a time of flight lighter, because that should give me the result that light travels at the same speed no matter what medium it's in. And I was a bit skeptical about whether the LiDAR in here would be time of flight because it seems like such an impossible task. You know, you have to be pulsing these lasers incredibly fast. And then not only that, when it comes back, you have to be able to very accurately and quickly measure the light and how long it took. And these are very, very short timescales that we're talking about. Like, you know, the time that it takes light to go from the top of this jug of water to the bottom is almost nothing. Um, but it turns out the LiDAR in here really is a time of flight LiDAR. Uh, it uses some really cool technology. I was reading the patterns for it and yeah, it's kind of amazing. Um, it actually has a single photon avalanche detector in it, which uh, I really want one of those. So yeah, this is the real deal. And let's do the experiment again and see if we get the same result. It turns out that a big part of what I was doing wrong last time was that I had the phone way too close to the water. And at such short distances, so I'd say like less than 20 centimeters, it's really bad. But the phone seems quite good once you have distances of about 30 centimeters. So here I've got this saying that this distance from here to the table is about 31 centimeters. But if I instead use this, um, I get a distance of, yeah, 30.6, so very similar. So these two ways of measuring the speed of light agree for now when there's no water in the way, but let's see what happens when I move the water. And now it's saying that this distance is 33.6 or so. Let's see if this agrees. Whoa, look at this, 33.9. <laughs> so they agree. <laughs> so I, I really am wrong. Okay. 
In the next video, I investigated why light actually slows down. But before you watch that, I'd highly recommend the video on 3Blue1Brown on this topic.